All right. It is about 7.03, so I think it's a good time to get started. Um, again, my name is Eddie. I use he, him pronouns, and I am the genealogy and local history librarian at Arlington Heights Memorial Library. Thank you so much for being here. Um, welcome, Carlos Ferretete, Caristo. Um, thank you for being here. We're so grateful that you're here tonight to learn a little bit about beginning Greek genealogy. Um, before I introduce our presenter, I wanted to bring your attention to some of the upcoming events and happenings here at Arlington Heights Memorial Library in the genealogy department. Um, this Friday, if you're in the area and can join us in person in the Cardinal Room, Jackie Shatner is going to be doing a beginning genealogy program. I'll put the registration information in the chat. That's happening on Friday uh, from 2 p.m. to 3.30 p.m. Uh, if this piques your interest and you want to get you started on a broader, more uh, complete genealogy process, um, you know, to find your Greek ancestry and beyond, um, you're welcome to follow up your experience tonight with um, by visiting us in person and learning from Jackie. Um, after that, we have later this month on June 22nd, Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of German Military Records. Uh, and that is going to be Thursday, June 22nd from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. also in the library in the Cardinal Room. Um, so if you also have German ancestry uh, and you want to find out you know, their war records going back through the Napoleonic Wars. That's going to be a very interesting program as well. Um, in I'm going to be teaching myself Intro to Ancestry Library Edition. That's part of our big four programs this summer. So in genealogy work, the big four databases, um, pretty much the bread and butter of any beginner genealogist is going to be starting with Ancestry, Find My Past, My Heritage, um, and so we're going to start with Intro to Ancestry Library Edition. That's going to be in the training center. It will be an in-depth training on how to use these materials. And you can sign up now. There is limited space. So if you're interested in that, you can always check that out. I will go ahead and drop those links in the chat as well. Uh, and then as always, you're always welcome to check out the other genealogy related databases and resources that we have through Arlington Heights Library in the Shackley Room. Or if you want, if you're an Arlington Heights Memorial Library card holder, I am personally available for one on one genealogy con consultations, and I will also put that link in the chat. Those can be really fun. We can do a deeper dive into the databases. We can work you through any of your brick walls, or we can even just talk about how you want to organize your genealogy or what you're looking to get out of it. So I'll put that link as well. If you'd like to schedule an individual appointment, we'll have some fun. Uh, and now, without further ado, I wanted to introduce our um, presenter tonight, and that is Georgia Stryker Kielman. We're so happy to have her. Georgia, am I saying that correctly? Good enough. <laughs> okay. uh, she is the founder of the Hellenic Genealogy Geek Facebook group and blog. She started in 2010. Through these and her websites, she and her researchers disseminate and categorize thousands of genealogical records related to Greek ancestry and beyond. Uh, as a third generation immigrant with all four grandparents coming from Greece, Georgia has been collecting books and documentation on Greek immigrants and the wider diaspora for about 30 years. Her Hellenic Genealogy Geek Facebook group now has over 42,000 members, and she helps connect people with their Hellenic past every day. Find links to her blog and Facebook page on HellenicGenealogyGeek.com. I will go ahead and put that in the chat, and I know that there are probably some people who are joining us from that group, and to you I say welcome. Georgia, thank you so much for being here, and take it away. Thank you, Eddie. I am so excited that the Arlington Heights Memorial Library has scheduled this presentation. Um, back in 2015, we held our first Hellenic Genealogy Conference in New York City. And at that point, we had 2,500 members in our Facebook group, and we thought we were really something. Um, interest in Greek genealogy research has grown significantly over the last few years to greater than 40,000 people worldwide who are members of the Facebook group. And interestingly, about 20% of those are from Greece. So they like to join in and help also. And that's a huge asset. Now, these members are very engaged. And if you post a question or ask for a translation, odds are that you'll have multiple answers within minutes. This is an exciting time to research your Hellenic ancestors. 
The outline for today's presentation is we're gonna look at preparation for research in Greek records, different types of Greek documents, Greek records online, how to order Greek documents that aren't online, Asia Minor research, and what to know before hiring a professional genealogist for Greek research. Now you must know the surname used in Greece and you must know the exact village. Now, everyone who's attempting to do family history research on their immigrant ancestors, no matter what country they're from, has to go through the same process. So keep the following in mind when you start to research. In Greece, when you meet someone new, they don't ask, what is your name? The question is, Poselena, what do they call you? Now, these common practices will complicate your research. You have nicknames or parasuklis. Somebody could be called Mikolakakos or Aridas, meaning long legs. So due to naming patterns in a village, there could be several boys or girls around the same age with the exact same name, first name and last name. To distinguish them, villagers may say, oh, He's the Yanis with long legs. He is referred to as Yanis Aridas. Father's names used as surnames with an ending of Akos, Apulos, Akis. So Kostakos is the son of Kostas. Iliopoulos is the family of Elias. Choosing a totally different name, like Kolokotos instead of Lambropoulos. Or listing two different names interchangeably, Yanias or Zuneris. Now, if your name is Pappas here in the United States, that is a shortened version of your Greek name. So just to show the point, in this one village, Ioannis in Sparta, here's all the surnames that start with Papa. Many of these people would have viewed Pappas as their name when they came to the States. You need to figure out which family name is yours. And the same goes for Poulos. This is from that very same village. All of these people have Poulos on the end of their names, which means family of. So again, you need to determine which name is really associated with your family. Now, this is something that can trip you up every time. We all have this in our family trees, most of us anyways. Now this is not an absolute, but it's a very common Greek naming tradition. And that is the first son be named after the paternal grandfather. So in this example, the grandfather's named Paniotis. His sons are Yanis, Demetrios, and Stavros. Each one of them have sons and the first son will be named Paniotis. Now I have multiple Paniotis in the same generation, born within a few years or even just a few months of each other. All of them have the same last name. You need to pay special attention to this when you begin research in US records. Most Greek immigrants, immigrants use their father's name as the middle name on US records. So taking note of this will assure that you are not researching the wrong family line, Paniotis son of Yanis versus Paniotis son of Demetrius. Now you also need to know the exact village and you must know the municipality and region. So it's not just Ioannis, but Ioannis, Sparta, Laconia. This map shows there are three villages near Sparta named Ioannis, all in different municipalities. Have you ever wondered why you can't find your ancestor's village on a Google map? Well, the answer can be found on this website. The link is on the handout. If you haven't downloaded the handout for this presentation, do it right after the presentation because there's a lot of useful links in there. Also with this website is a link to a blog posting by my friend, Carol Kostakis-Petranik, 
that she did on her Spartan Roots blog that's beyond the basics, the EETAA website, Nuggets of Important Information. It's a little complicated to get through this site, but this is what you get. Now, I am going to recommend that everyone print this for every village you are researching, and I'll show you why. Um, this shows from 1835, when these, the settlement is originally attached to the municipi of Manthodeus, all the different dates when either the municipality changed or the village name changed. This will um, really help you when you're researching um, different records. So you have to know when, it depends on what records you're searching, but if you're looking at the general archives in Greece, their records are gonna be based on the original name of the village and municipality. Some more recent things that have been indexed will be by the new name of the municipality. So you need to have all this information and um, that'll help you also map out where this is really located. So start collecting information. First things first, ask your relatives for copies of any documents and photographs. Discuss and document any family stories. You might not get all the information in the first visit, but believe me, there'll be plenty of follow-up questions to ask. Try to find as many records as possible about your ancestor and their family. Each record will either confirm information or lead you to further investigation. They will all add a little spice to the knowledge you have about your ancestor and their family. Not fluent in reading or writing Greek? Here's a research tip, and I've used it. As you find documents and photos, et cetera, with your ancestor surname typed or written, <coughs> Excuse me, my allergies are acting up. Take a photo of it. Collect each surname in a document for future reference. So this is my great grandfather, Yorgos Dratigopoulos. There it is written in Greek. And underneath it's handwritten from one of the church registers. So now I'm collecting those signatures and it'll help me learn to identify his name when I'm reading, seeing it in Greek records. Okay, now talk to all your living grandparents if you have them, uncles, aunts, cousins. Um, they all have a little different information. My brothers and I grew up in the same household, but we have a little bit different information you have different conversations with your parents and grandparents. Did they know the given names, the original surnames and the village of origin and use oral history to uncover stories and clues about things. Now, you start with US records and the link to this chart is included in the presentation handout. The left column is the type of records and along the top will say the type of information you can you can find on each record. This is a close-up of that. Um, so you can see this chart will help you you know make a checklist and determine which records can provide which type of information for you. A few more things to think about. Many of our immigrant ancestors were illiterate. They didn't care if their names were misspelled on the records. Um, they didn't celebrate birthdays. They celebrated saints' names days instead. So many did not know their actual birth dates. They made up the dates on the records. My one grandfather openly admitted he used, you know, Greek Independence Day as his birthday, which a lot of people did. I have another uncle I was looking at, or great uncle I was looking at a couple of weeks ago. He used a different birth date on absolutely every single record. Okay, now again, remember that different types of records contain different information. Therefore, find as many sources as possible to verify facts. 
and research family members, not just their immediate ancestors. So what we're talking about is if it's your grandfather that immigrated, that migrated to the US, you really need to look at his brothers and sisters that also migrated. Okay, it's time to talk about various types of Greek records that can be accessed for your Greek family history research. And here's another handout. Here are a couple of tools, there's two actually, um, that we put together to help you understand what information is on Greek records and how you can access these records. Make sure you download these. This particular chart lists the type of Greek record and the type of information you can find on each one. The next one is part two of this tool, and it lists the type of record in the, the first column. The second column is the physical repository in Greece, along with an, a link to contact information. And we'll use that when we talk about writing for records, if we need to. And the third one needs to be updated a little bit, but it's the online repository. So for instance, if it's at the General Archives in Greece, if it's on MyHeritage, if it's on GreekAncestry.net. And then at the end is an explanation of each type of record. Now, there are overlaps in some of the records available on all the following websites, just like with FamilySearch, Ancestry.com, MyHeritage. Some of their records are the same. Some are very different. Some are unique. That's the same with the ones we're going to talk about now. So there are only two companies right now that offer Greek records online indexed, name indexed in both Greek and English. That's GreekAncestry.net and myheritage.com. These two collections are is where I, this is where I would recommend you begin. Now, greekancestry.net was founded in 2020 by Gregory Kantos. His headquarters is in Athens, Greece. You can search the database for free. There's no re subscription required. The original record may provide additional information such as the father's name, the mother's name, the occupation, the age, et cetera. And you can refer to his collections page to determine specific information contained on a particular record. And we provide the link in a minute. The per, you pay per record. So once you search, you see some basic information. If you decide you want to order the record, you pay $8.99 per record, quantity discount supply. When you get the order, when you place your order, you'll receive all pertinent information on the record transcribed in both Greek and English. And in addition, Greek Ancestor provides a complete source citation and a record image at no additional cost. He has educational videos, free genealogy consultations. This is key, and we'll discuss this again later. And he does private research. So there's Gregory right there. This is the home page, and there's Gregory's photo. And to start, we're gonna, for the purposes of this presentation, we're going to click on search records on the upper right-hand corner. Now, these are the types of records available on GreekAncestry.net. He's got voter lists of Greece, Asia Minor refugee registers, business directories, mail registers of Greece, censuses, farmer census, parish census, parish voter list. And you can see descriptions of all these collections on that link at the bottom, GreekAncestry.net slash collections. Now, New collections are added all the time, almost every month. So keep checking back. This is the search page that you get on GreekAncestry.net. And I have to say, this is my first go-to place for Greek record searches. And the reason why is the way the search results are presented. 
and I'll show you that in a minute. Here's a little tip. I always do my first search on location only. This allows me to browse through any possible name variations of my surname in that village. So there's actually a drop down box where the location is and you can choose the village and the um, uh, municipality that it's in. So this is what the results look like. See, it's very easy to just scan right through. They come up sorted by last name. You can actually sort on any of the titles, just click on them and it'll resort. But I like to look through the names and scroll down to where my surname supposedly is and see different spellings because there are different spellings through the years. Spelling in 1844 might necessarily not be the same spelling in 1934. Now my heritage is over 2,500,000 Greek records. And this is great. And it's free. You don't need a subscription. It's free to use through the library portal. And I think Eddie will be able to explain that further for you. The records that my heritage has, first of all, you can go on location and just type in Greece and all of these will come up, a link to all of these records. But are the Greece electoral rolls and mail registers an exclusive collection only to my heritage that is the Sparta marriage collection, which is tremendous if you're from that area or in the surrounding villages. Also, the Corfu vital records are on here, which we'll discuss, city directories, and the farmer census from 1856. Hopefully, they're going to be adding more records also. Let's talk about these Sparta marriage records for a second. This collection includes marriage records created by and kept at the holy metropolis of Monomvasia in Sparta from 1835 to 1935. Now, is every marriage needed to be licensed and blessed by the area's metropolitan? The metropolis kept systematic records of the marriages in this jurisdiction. So the process was this, and it's important to understand this. The local priest in the village would prepare a marriage application, which is a letter, stating that the marriage request was legitimate. You know, they weren't cousins, there was no, they weren't married, there was, you know, no reason that they shouldn't be married. The Metropolitan would approve and issue a license stating that the marriage could take place. And then the metropolis entered the marriage information into a register. Now, this is a little hard to read because I was trying to cram everything on one page, but you'll get the gist of it. This is what the marriage record collection looks like on my heritage. This is for my grandfather, um, my great grandfather, actually, Anastasios Kritikos. And you'll see it's written in Greek and English. It says he was born in Sparta. His father, Critikos, no first name there to begin with. The name of the bride, Gondilo Monosaku. And her father's name, I think that's a K, Monosaku. Now, where it says ordinal number, that is actually the number on the register right below. Um, that will is the line that the information is written on on the register. And this marriage took place March 29th, 1893. Again, these are exclusive to my heritage. On the side, it, well, first of all, if in fact there's more than one document available, you'll see that above the picture of the document, there is a little Num, you know, one of three, one of two, and an arrow, and you can click over and see the other documents. These particular documents are the letter from the priest and the agreement from the metropolis. Now, sometimes there could be five documents, six documents. There could be no documents. And here's how this was done. 
couple, well, a couple years ago now, um, the registry books, which is in the main photograph, is what was um, digitized and indexed. And that is the information you see above typewritten. A year later, digitized were the letters that go along with it. And those were supplements that were attached to the original record that my heritage had. So it is my recommendation that if you um, have these records attached to a direct ancestor of yours, that you have these letters translated. And I'll tell you why. They can give you no additional information or they can give you a lot of additional information, such as the father of the bride is deceased. And so the mother named Marigal has agreed to sign for the marriage. She has agreed to agree to the marriage. She is illiterate. So she agrees to have somebody else sign for her. In the documents, it can also list the age of the bride and the groom and other pertinent information that isn't in the original register. So I would definitely give it a shot and have the letters translated. Um, My Heritage also, um, along with GreekAncestry.net, have the business directories from 1901 to 1947. Um, it's about 200,000 city, city directory records. Um, and it covers all of Greece, except for the Dodecanese Islands. Now, might they're just like business directories here. They might give you the first name, the last name, the occupation, the address, and sometimes maybe the father's initial or name. Voter lists of Greece. These are key records. They are on GreekAncestry.net and MyHeritage, but not necessarily the same records. So I would check both websites. So in 1844, the Greek constitution was passed and elections were held to create the first parliament. So these lists were kept of names and ages of all men over the age of 25 who were eligible to vote. After 1864, the eligible voters age was reduced to 21 years. Now I want you to notice on the right-hand side, that's an early voter list, handwritten. And later on in the 1870s or so, you're gonna see um, type uh, printed election lists, which are much easier for you and I to read. But um, uh, there's a, a great number of these have been translated, but I have to tell you that they're not all available. Greece's records aren't consistent and they're still discovering some of these squirreled away. The elections were held at local levels. Sometimes you'll, they'll find an election list in a village somewhere and then they'll be able to you know, digitize that. Oh, let me go back one step. If you don't already know, think this through. So this is an election list from 1844 and it gives the father's, the the grandfather is on this list and it shows his age is 65. Well, that's an 1844 election list. Minus 65, the age of the grandfather, brings you back into the 1700s um, for when he was born. So these are very valuable tools. The Greece Corfu Vital Records Collection from 1841 to 1932. This is quite a spectacular collection if you are from Corfu. Um, This collection consists of birth, marriage, and death certificates from the entire island of Corfu and that are kept at the General State Archives at Corfu. These are on my heritage. 
Now, let's move on to Family Search. FamilySearch.org has over 1,800 microfilms containing millions of records from all over Greece. And these microfilms have all microfilms, microfilms have all been digitized, and most are available for viewing at over 5,000 family history centers worldwide or at any family history affiliate library. And the host of this particular presentation, the Arlington Heights Memorial Library, is a family history affiliate library. Now, if you don't come from this area, if you're watching it from outside of this area, you can go to familysearch.org slash centers slash locations to find a family history affiliate library near you. These records, however, are not indexed or translated. Uh, my recommendation would be um, to explore the Family Search catalog for records from Greece before visiting the Family Search Center or affiliate library, because you'll need to make note of the specific film you want to view. Um, watch the free Roots Tech presentation that's on your handout that Carol Kostakis Petranik did online Greek records at Family Search, and she goes through a very thorough um, walkthrough of how you can look at these Greek records. Now, there are a couple that are pretty easy to deal with. They're not handwritten. A lot of these are handwritten. This is an example of a record available through Family Search. This is a list of people who fulfill the criteria to be called as jurors. The Government Gazette printed the names, ages, villages, occupations, and annual income of men who were eligible to serve on juries. So when a jury was needed, these men could be called to appear. Now, if you've been keeping track of how your surname looks in Greek, you should be able to identify it in these lists. The other thing is military lists are um, on family search. Now, you can't see these unless you go into the Family History Library Center, I believe. So you have to or go to the library here. Another example is um, the military list, which is printed in the Government Gazette, the official government newspaper, okay? It lists men who turned 18 years old during that year and then were then eligible to serve in the military. Early versions like this one in 1886 list the candidate soldier's name. Later versions may indicate his age and occupation. Again, when I first looked at these, I looked at them on microfilm many years ago. And I had a little scrap of paper with me with a handwritten thing of how I thought my grandfather's name was spelled in Greek and I just scan through the list. You can do it too. Okay, now the General State Archives of Greece. These records, again, are not translated or indexed by name, and I'm not gonna go into them in great detail. The uh, link to the website is at the bottom of this website. It's also on your handout. This is the main page. We call it the GAC, it's the General Archives. Um, looks to me like I right clicked and translated it into English. It will come up in Greek. Um, this is the main page and now there's millions of records digitized and they're doing millions more. Let me show you this, browse the archives, number one. This is the Central Service Archives. That's the archives located in Athens. There are archives that are the regional archives underneath that that are located all over Greece, um, which have different records, okay? And down at the bottom where you see number three, that actually is an area where you can search the archives here for a specific type of record, but you have to type it in Greek. Now, if you 
click on Central Archives, the Central Service Archives, this is the first page that comes up. Now you can click on the maps, the uh, flags at the top and translate, but I'll be honest with you, I would rather right click with my mouse and it does a more thorough job of translating this. You can click on any of the regional archive office to see some more pages and click through to view digital images on many. This is not the first place I would suggest beginners start researching. Um, as you click through, you can find thousands of digitized records, but um, this site is a little hard to navigate and many of these records are like this. Um, if you ever looked at what is in a university library um, archive, and they'll tell you in this box, there's a folder that contains minutes of this meeting, and there's another folder that contains the people that attended that, and then there's another folder that might have payroll stubs in it, and there's another, that's what these are. These are indexes of what categories of things could be in the box. Now, some of the boxes are digitized, and so you're gonna be able to see every record in the box. Others are not. They're just telling you they have the record. I'm not gonna go further on this because this is an entire hour long presentation in itself to talk about the general archives. And um, this is for a later date, I'm sure. <laughs> Okay, now let's talk about archival repositories in Greece. Um, and where, you know, copies of records are kept. So there's civil records and they're kept in two places. Municipal offices, like the office of the mayor or the town hall or the Lexarchion. Or there's the archive offices. Which one will be the most helpful to you? Well, the municipality offices, their primary function is local government responsibilities. Their staff's very busy with civil duties and they really aren't gonna go out of their way to help. The archive offices may also have some of the same documents and their job and older documents also, but their job is to assist researchers. So I would start with the archive. Let's go back to this document locator that we showed you before, it's in the handout. Um, the second column, remember, outlines where the physical records are kept. These are live links on the PDF in your um, handout. And when you download this and It'll take you so, to a link where you should be able to locate the office in your area. Now, you're gonna communicate by email in Greek. So type your message you know, um, in a Word document and provide as specific possible as possible information about what you want, the name, the range of dates, the village, and start by asking for a specific record. I would start by asking for one record at a time to see you know, how quickly they respond and how, respond, how receptive they are. So this is how you write for records. Try to find what you can online and then write and try to locate these other records. Now, civil records. These are the different types of civil records. There's mail registers, municipal registers, voter lists, and the vital records. Okay, so after the revolution in 1821, which overthrew 400 years of Ottoman rule, the new nation of Greece organized the central government. And record keeping was underway by the early 1840s with local municipalities documenting the male population for tax, voting, and military purposes. Local municipalities began to collect the information in a format known as the Mitron Adenon or the male registers. 
supposedly, and I added that in, every male is listed. But you know, in the early years, um, the family would have to come and register. And that didn't necessarily happen right away. Now this proves a man was registered in his village and it includes the child's name, the father's name, the birth year, not the date, the birth year and the place. This is an important record to have. The other thing is the municipal records, the dematologia. Now these documents are official registers of families living in a village. Um, kind of like a census, but think of it as an ongoing census, okay? So they're created in the mid 1900s, sometimes like 1955, and they're using information retrospectively, sometimes. So sometimes the dates are not gonna be exactly correct. Um, it proves the family's residence, so you can continue to research in that area. And it'll also give you parents' names going back one or more generation. So now it lists the head of the household, his father's first name and his mother's first name, year and place of birth, occupation, citizenship status, and result reason for removal from the record. Let's say he died. Then it gives the same information for the wife, and the children. So this is what the headings look like. I'm not gonna read through them all the way, but you can use this as a reference when you're reading this. So there's comes in two pages, a big um, log book, registry book, right? Second page looks like this. Now, this is what you'll actually get. Copies of the first page and the second page. In Greek, handwritten. Um, you, if you get this and you need help, you can post a picture of it on the Facebook group and somebody will help you. Uh, or, and you're going to learn how to read Greek handwriting. At first, when I first got one of these, that back then it was in the mail, I was horrified. I was excited and horrified at the same time. I didn't know how to read it, what it was, um, because some of the handwriting is a little screwy. screwy. But um, it gives a lot of excellent information. It'll give you the entire family, unless you had a... Uh, grandmother who belonged to one of these families and she migrated to the U.S. in 1915. She's no longer listed as part of the family. Remember, this is a family register and it's being created like in the 1950s. So she's no longer there. You're going to find people missing that migrated to another country. Okay, now there's also civil marriages, uh, civil records. There's an, uh, on the civil marriage records, you'll have the name of the bride and groom, the registry office information and parents' names, and marriage information and signatures. Um, in the uh, civil birth records, birth and baptism records, You'll get the name of the child, certificate number, birth information is reported to the municipal office and baptismal information is reported to the municipal office. And then there's a civil death record. Same thing, name of deceased, information about the death provided to the registry office. Remember, these aren't the original, that this is information that was provided to the civil office. Now, real quickly, let's talk about Asia Minor research. This is a huge subject. Again, we could have an entire presentation just on this. Um, you saw earlier, we said that um, GreekAncestry.net had some Asia Minor refugee um, records online. 
Um, there are a lot more coming. There are a lot of records that have are not in the archives of Greece, but have been um, transcribed and are online through different organizations. You can find links to many of those on the HellenicGenealogyGeek.com research links website. There'll be online databases, films and videos, ton of websites that deal with Asia Minor, the articles and books. And um, there's more to come. I mean, I have a lot more that needed to be added to that page. There is a lot of information out there and a lot of people very interested. Also, um, the GAC has gotten a, you know, the General Archives has gotten a um, approval by the government to spend a lot of money to, to digitize the rest of their records. Part of their collections are the church books, the registers that the priests had, that they brought with them from Asia Minor when they escaped and came to Greece. And a lot of those books are sitting at the General Archives and need to be digitized. So that would be very exciting. Now, let's just for a moment, talk about using a professional genealogist. And I just wanted to cover this quickly, but it's very important. Links to each of these documents are in the handout. Um, a few years ago, some of our members on the Hellenic Genealogy Geek Facebook group were very unhappy after working with several Greek genealogists. So I followed up with the people who were unhappy and also spoke to the people who had done the research. And there's a huge disconnect between expectations and what was being delivered. Now, there's a few things everyone needs to understand. There is no standard or accreditation process for genealogists in Greece. This isn't like other countries in Europe. The whole process really starts with you. Um, I've developed a few tools to assist you and I've attached samples of uh, requests for quotation, um, an example of a research report and I've gone, gone over a code of ethics that we put together. I've gone over it with a couple of the, there aren't that many, of uh, people who are doing Greek genealogy research in Greece. And I think things have improved somewhat. But um, they were not providing clear, they didn't understand, okay, th that they needed to provide. They just were people that went out and got documents for people. The, they didn't understand they needed to provide a clear source of information, the translation of the material associated with each record. Um, a commentary on each record. Some of these Greek researchers didn't understand that the documents needed to be translated in English. Um, and finally, the invoices were a problem because they didn't want to and didn't um, break down the charges and what they were charging for and their travel expenses and receipts and everything else. So I usually don't make recommendations, but I'm going to today. If you decide you want to go down this road, I suggest you contact Gregory Contos at GreekAncestry.net and set up a free consultation. He'll be very honest with you if you need to gather more information, if the information isn't going to be available, what it would cost up front. And if you decide not to go with him, fine. But at least get the free consultation and understand what you're getting yourself into. Now, in conclusion, you don't have to do this alone. There's 40,000 members of the Hellenic Genealogy Facebook group out there to assist you. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, my allergies. 
thousands of links to resources on the Hellenic Genealogy Geek resource links website and the blog. So thanks for letting me give this presentation. And um, I'm very excited that Arlington Heights asked me to. Um, that was a fantastic presentation with so much good information that I will personally be using. Uh, oh, we have some time for some questions. Uh, I want to start with one that uh, one of our attendees raised earlier um, when you were talking about Greek voting records. Um, yes. Do you know offhand or is there a resource where you can look up if immigrants from Asia Minor would be have been eligible to vote and therefore um, accessible through those records? Okay. Um, yes. Well, they weren't voting in Asia Minor, but when they came um, escape from Asia Minor into, into Greece, they voted. They were allowed to vote and they those voting records include additional information for them and they are transcribed and available. Um, I think uh, my heritage has them. Hmm. So you, um, I can't remember it, one either Greek ancestry or my heritage has them digitized and transcribed and searchable. Fantastic, yeah. And like you mentioned earlier, my heritage is not accessible through your homes. But if you ever visit Arlington Heights Memorial Library, they allow us to provide access to all customers. <laughs> Whether you are an Arlington Heights card holder or not, we can get you onto My Heritage to access those records. And you can also, um, if you have a specific query, you can also uh, have me hunt something down for you. I'd be happy to do that. Sorry um, about my coffee. No, no, of course. Now. Okay. okay. I mean, between between allergy season and the smog that's coming down from the wildfires. Oh, no oh goodness. I hope everybody's doing okay. We have another question in the chat. Um, could you elaborate on some details on research regarding um, Greeks that came to the US and Australia from Smyrna and Turkey before the 1920s? Uh, is it possible to research back to the mid 1800s and forward? Well, um, that's why we'd all love to get those church record books um, digitized that are at the gap that came over because they'll have a ton of information. Other than the church books, the other records are going to be in Turkish. Mm -hmm. There are records. If you go um, on this link for the, on Hellenic Genealogy Geek for Asia Minor, there are links to some presentations, three different presentations that we've had three different professors give on Asia Minor records on Ottoman records and how to look at them. And if you care to, whether you whether you can access them and read them, I would it would be worth watching those, those videos. Hmm. I'm gonna go ahead and link those videos into the chat. Okay. Um, and yes, please, if you are, are, are watching or, or listening with another family member, please just let me know in the chat and I will make sure that you get counted in our attendance. Also, uh, when you get the email with the recording, as well as the documents, um, the handouts as well, there will be a survey. If you enjoyed this presentation or if you have any ideas for how we can improve um, the, the lineup of programming or if you want to request or recommend any programming, please feel free to fill that out. I'm going to go ahead and link um, Genealogy Geek website or uh, uh, Hellenic Genealogy Geek's website so you can uh, bookmark that for later and then we'll get to the next few questions here. But actually, while I do that, uh, the next question that we had is, is it realistic to find any records prior to 1821, given the 400 year occupation? Um, you can draw conclusions, like I said, from the uh, some of the records, but there are records, but they aren't very thorough. There's a couple of people out there that have actually done some of the um, some translations, but the records are pretty general. They might list a family name, but to be honest with you, that family name is not the same name that would have been used later on. There, and sometimes it's just a first name, and it might be just general census information. So I haven't seen anything. I'm sure it's out there. Mm -hmm. 
Another question, uh, any information on these sites for Scopilos? You know, I saw that come up and I was just going to do a search right now. Hold on. Please feel free to add any questions to the chat. We have a few more minutes and I uh, would love it if you took advantage of the wonderful resource that we have here in Georgia. Um, I was I was fortunate enough to, to live in Greece for about four months uh, doing archaeology work. Oh, cool. Um, and I will never meet uh, a, a people more passionate about their heritage and history and willing to share um, than the people that I met in the Peloponnesus and uh, in Crete, where I was for a month and a half. And it was just a wonderful experience. And um, if anybody, oh yeah, I was in Delphi. I was in uh, Thessaloniki. Uh -huh. um, Thessaloniki was fantastic. Um, I really enjoyed my time there. Um, but um, so, I spent, go ahead. I'm, it's just popping my, um, you really have to go look on GreekAncestry.net and my heritage to see if there's records for those areas. Odds are there are. They pretty much covered most of Greece, even the islands. Um, if not, some of the islands have their own individual records that they put online. And um, I, I don't know specifically, I don't have it here in front of me. Um, Gregory Contos, he was at, um, he was available through um, uh, GreekAncestry.net, correct? I'll go ahead and link that. Yes, in the it's chat again. .net. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go ahead and put that in the chat for you to bookmark. All right. I'm just going to get a couple more questions here. Um, in your opinion, how effective is using genetics genealogy for Greek ancestry? Um, well, first of all, let's talk about why do it. So the, the, um, are you trying to, you know, are you trying to figure out if you're Greek or are you trying to make connections to cousins? And, um, and if you're trying to make connections to cousins, it's actually quite effective. You know, we have a lot, uh, a period of time in the 1950s, 60s, where there were a lot of children that were illegally adopted out of Greece into the U.S. and a couple of other countries. Those people are now doing DNA tests and hooking up with relatives in Greece, sometimes meeting their birth parents. So in that case, I believe that, you know, and the more people in Greece that do DNA tests, the better off we'll be. Perfect. So I have, uh, so we'll do two more questions. First, I have, uh, I've heard village names were different under Ottoman rule versus Greek independence. Any resources for how to find old versus current village names? Um, if you look at that EETAA website that I used in my presentation, it's on the handout. Though the original name of the village in many cases is the Turkish name. And then you'll see it changed later on and they went and changed all the village names. So that's one clue. The other thing is um, off the top of my mind, I, I can't remember. I mean, I don't think I know of a resource but I'm sure there's one out there. Um, I would I would probably add um, uh, the Acropolis Museum has a historical maps and archive um, historical maps and atlases archive of, uh, of, of of Greece. So does the National Museum. Um, I can link that as well into the to the email so that you can check on that information. Um, if you're so, part of the Hellenic Genealogy Geek Facebook group, put the question out there, somebody should put the question out there and ask. And uh, I'd love to see what the responses are because I'm sure you'll get some. Mm -hmm. 